Uh, okay, so there's some function. F prime of that function is negative 4x plus 5. Okay. And, and it says this function that has this derivative goes through 4, 10. There's a function that has the derivative negative four, that's not very clear, negative four x plus five. That's the first criteria. So which of these, a, b, c, d, or e, could have this as its derivative? B, c, and e. B, c, and e. All three of them can have that as a derivative? Yes. But they're different. So how can they all have that as a derivative? Because the constant of the derivative of the constant is zero. So no matter what the constant is at the end, all the derivatives of those are the same. This is kind of a precursor to some other stuff. Anti-derivatives, the integral. Okay. So what are we? We're eliminating a and d. Those can't have the correct derivatives. Okay. So that part has seemed to serve its purpose. So it also says that it goes to the point 4, 10, or in other words, when you put x into the function, you get out 10. When you put 4 into the function, you get out 10. So you look at those three possibilities, b, c, and e, plug it 4, and there's only one of them, since they're identical except for the constant, only one of them with the correct constant should give you 10. They're all different, but just a little bit. If you put it for B and it's not right, then clearly it's going to need to be either one bigger or two smaller, right? Because this was 24, you're adding 24. Uh, not sure what you get with that one, but if it's wrong, then the only other options are to be plus 25, which would just be one more than plus 24, or plus 22, which would be two less than plus 24. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so. For now, this is just a multiple choice question because we don't know what antiderivatives, we don't know about initial values and all that kind of stuff. But apparently for E, you say E? E. E, when you plug 4 into the function given at E, uh, you get 10, like you should. <coughs> okay. What's next? Uh, yeah, 3. 3. Locate the absolute extreme of the function. Uh, the closed interval from 0 to 8. It's important that it says the closed interval from 0 to 8. It means that it has values on the left and the right, and it, like, it ends there at those two endpoints. Okay? Um, so, let's look at this real quick. Let's say this is 0 and this is 8. We don't know for sure what this function looks like, but let's pretend that we don't have really an idea. So, our possibilities are uh, an absolute maximum, like maybe up here, uh, or maybe an absolute minimum on this side. Same over here, maybe an absolute maximum or an ab absolute minimum. Okay, maybe on the side. Or in the middle, maybe in the middle somehow it gets above there or below there. So maybe there's an absolute maximum in the middle or an absolute maximum in the middle. Is that making sense? Yeah. Okay. Just kind of have to imagine. So our absolute maximum and minimum could be on the left. Uh, could be on the right, could be somewhere in the middle. Okay. Um, if it's somewhere in the middle, if there is some maximum value somewhere in the middle, where will that happen? Right. At a zero slope. Got to be a zero slope, right? If there is no zero slope, then the function would probably do something like this, or maybe like this. And your absolute maximum or minimum is just going to be on one side or the other. If it's in the middle, it has to come up and back down. What's that? Uh, I was just saying that if you looked at the slope and if it was positive or negative, we know whether it's on the left or right side. Right? If it's on the left or right side of what? Like, um, it's on the zero side or the eight side. Like, if it has a 
negative slope, it's going to be on the left side because it's going down. So, on the lower side, x value wise. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I follow you. Maybe let's work through it and then uh, show me what you're talking about. Um, okay, so that that's just maybe the scenario that runs through our head, and we know that on the left or the right or somewhere in the middle, there's an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. Find the derivative is usually a safe bet. F prime equals 3x squared minus 48. I think that's actually equal to zero. So it equal to zero because no, that's fine. the only possible and place you can have a maximum or a minimum. So x squared equals 48 divided by 16. 16. Go plus or minus. Ooh, yeah. Oops. Okay. Do we have anything to say about plus or minus 4? It has to be minus 4. It can be minus 4, why not? Because it's not in the interval. Not in the interval, so we don't care about that one. All right. So just plus 4. So positive 4 is the only candidate for a max or a min on that interval. Okay. Are we going to figure out if that's a maximum or a minimum? Oh, we're going to just find a double derivative. Okay. It doesn't tell us what to do, so we can use the second derivative test. So f double prime is 6x. That's a really simple second derivative. I'm very happy about that. Okay. Well, why do we do that? Why are we going to find the second derivative? Let's see if it's going to, is it f double prime of x as well as, I mean, it's like x squared, right? Uh, zero. Uh, then it's three. Okay. Or, if it's positive, positive is a minimum. Okay. If this is positive at an x value, we have concave up. If it's negative, it's concave down. If it's concave up, and we're at that zero slope right there, we have a minimum. It's not to down and we find ourselves at a zero slope, then we must have a maximum. But here's a zero slope right here. Okay, so let's just take four, we'll put it in there. So six times four is 24. It doesn't matter what it is exactly, but it's positive, right? It's positive, so the original function is concave up. And concave up along with a zero slope, we put those together and we find it's a minimum, okay? Um, so on that interval from 0 to 8, could there possibly be another value that is smaller than this one? No. 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 We'd have to go all the way back to negative 4, and then probably, if, if that happens to be a maximum, It would be a maximum It would be a maximum. Yeah. That's what I said. So oh. if it turned out to be a maximum, and then you have to go past that maximum, and then go down and down and down and down to get anywhere near getting smaller than whatever that value was, right? So on that interval from 0 to 8, this is definitely the absolute minimum. Okay? And how do we decide what the absolute maximum value is? Well, if we are on the interval from zero to eight, right? zero to eight, there's zero, there's eight. We found a minimum at four. Can I get it closer as possible to negative four? No, this is the minimum. I know. No, we're trying to find the highest slope. It's decreasing. No, we're trying to find the highest value. Highest value. Highest value of y for the original function. Go to eight. Go to eight, or maybe zero. Probably eight. Probably. But it's definitely at zero or eight, so we definitely we've got to look at both. We've got to look at the value of f at zero and eight. So we'll have to look at f of zero and f of eight. One of those has to be the most maximum value. Right? Because it won't even start to maybe come back down until we get back over to negative four. Because that is the only other possible maximum there is. So f of 0 is, mm, that's f maybe f prime of 0? Oh, yeah. f of 0, the actual y value of the function is 0. We got x cubed minus 48x, that's 0. 0. Well, 8 
8 is definitely has the absolute maximum, but we have to find what that absolute maximum is. So we actually have to plug it in. So we get 8 times 8 times 8. No idea what that is. 8 is 512. Oh, that's big. 512 minus 48 times 8. Okay, 128 is the absolute max. Yep. So you found that four uh, x equals four was one of the extreme ones. Possible. Yeah, possible. Yeah. Possible yeah. extreme. Okay. You put it into f double prime. Yes. Okay, so if uh, if f double prime of c is positive, like greater than zero, then we have a, a concave up situation, okay. and it's a concave up, the, and it's got a zero slope, and we must be looking at a minimum, okay. and then vice versa, so negative concave down. And the fact that 24 is positive, and, and well, it's okay, I see. The fact that it is that number 24, yeah. absolutely irrelevant. The positive is what we care about. Okay. Yeah. Could it ever be a minimum or a maximum if f double prime came out to be zero and we plug it in? Uh, if it came out to be zero, yeah, could it be a maximum or a minimum? Go back, checking on f, check it. It could be. It could possibly be. Just repeat the first derivative test of that. Yeah, you gotta fall back on the first derivative test. Uh, if f double prime is equal to zero, what are we usually hoping we find if f double prime equals zero? Uh, what? Uh, point of inflection. Point of inflection of placing. Because concave up is positive second derivative, concave down is negative second derivative, so where it switches, it must switch from positive to negative, which means zero right there, that point of inflection. Okay, that doesn't mean that we're guaranteed a point of inflection, but it is the only place where we can find a point of inflection if we need zero. Okay. One example, though, where we don't find a point of inflection, but what we actually do is find a uh, minimum is x to the fourth. We don't have to do all the math, but here's x to the fourth. It looks like a parabola. It's just a little flatter on the bottom. Between, yeah. So it's flatter on the bottom. So at this point, we'll find a zero slope and a zero second derivative. Okay. So it's not a point of inflection, actually, it turns out to be a minimum. And you have to use the first derivative test to figure that out and find out that we have negative slopes here and positive slopes here and there we have a minimum. And the derivative will work. The derivative will be a third degree, so it'll be something like that, yeah. It'll be like this. Can we have something like that? You know, you know, you take a derivative of that. This is a quadratic, which is a parabola. And, okay. Or not a good one. You have a problem that finds some things with that. Yeah, number 10. Number 10. Is the definition of a critical number at any point where a slope is zero? Yes. So we just talked about it, points of inflection. Uh, that would be where we switch concavity, whether concave up to concave down or vice versa. Okay, And the concavity directly correlates to the positiveness and negativeness of the second derivative. Who is it? <laughs> uh, so it switches its concavity, and the concavity is directly linked to the positiveness or negativeness of the second derivative. So the second derivative must be zero where we switch this concavity. Okay? So let's find the derivative and the second derivative. Okay, so the only possible places we could find points of inflection would be where the second derivative is zero. Not a guarantee, but the only possibility is where the second derivative is zero. So we set it equals zero. Uh, so x equals five thirds. So at that place, that's possibly where we switch concavity, where we pass from positive or to negative, from positive to negative or negative to positive. Okay, but we might go from negative concavity back to negative concavity or positive to positive. 
Right, here's an example of where we go from positive concavity to positive concavity, and we still go through a zero of the second derivative. So we have to figure out, if this is a point of inflection, we have to prove that what happens at that point? Concavity changes. Concavity changes. So you can look at the concavity on the left and the concavity on the right. We're testing for a point of inflection in a similar way that we tested for maxima and minima using the first derivative test. Right? Looking on the left and the right to see if we switch. Okay, so we're going to do that same thing here. So 5 thirds, so we're going to look on the left. What's a good number to the left of 5 thirds? I like zero. Zero is easy to plug in. What's a good number to the right of five thirds? Two. Two. Two would be good. So zero and two. So we'll do negative six times zero plus ten equals ten. So that means that on the left, what's the positive on The second derivative is positive, which means what about the first, the original function? Up. So we'll look on the right at two. Negative six times two plus ten is negative two. So we switch so down. Concave, down. concave down. So this so is it could point be a point of inflection. But a point of inflection is a point. Yeah. Uh, so a y. A y of what? First. Of which function? function? Of the first function. That's where the point of inflection would be located. Right? So we put 5 thirds in there. We've got calculators. They can do that. Oh, OK. Yes. And so like for concave, you could, would you say it's negative infinity to 5 thirds? Yeah, if we're going to do a, if we're going to do the other part of that problem, is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh, it's concave up to the left of that place, so from negative infinity all the way to five thirds. Okay. And then it's concave, concave up, and then from then five thirds. From five thirds to infinity. To positive infinity, it's concave. Okay. So really, it looks like a three-parter, but it's really like all, they're all intertwined together. Okay. And can we do eleven real quick? Yeah. So we're going to find relative extreme of the function, use a second derivative test where applicable. Okay. What does it mean, second derivative test where applicable? How do you know if it's not applicable? Uh, if there were a hole, that, that might be a place. No. That'd be a, like a hole or a vertical asymptote. Uh, Why is the answer using both A and C? Uh, sometimes when I switch it from multiple choice to not multiple choice, the answer does not switch its format. Most of these questions are computer uh, derived. So I don't have to find the right two different versions of the test. And change all the numbers. Um, and probably what it means is maybe there's two answers. For this one, there's two answers. Yeah. Right. A and C. So we're finding a string one. So let's discuss real quickly what it looks like to use the second derivative test. First, we have to find places where we could have extrema. So you want to do the first derivative. First derivative, first derivative. First derivative and that's would have to be equal to zero. That's yeah. the only place we could possibly have extrema. We can also possibly have extrema where the derivative is undefined. Possibly. Okay, so the derivative could be undefined in a vertical asymptote. Clearly, that's not going to be the candidate for an extrema. Uh, or for an extrema. Yeah, extreme for an extreme. Um, but we could possibly have a thing like this, a cusp where the derivative is undefined. But these are really rare. And we know that with polynomials, that's not going to happen. Polynomials, polynomial graphs are nice and curvy. And we would say differentiable everywhere. It's not differentiable. But polynomials would be. So we'll stick to just a zero slope. OK, so let's just do that first. F prime of x equals 8x minus 16. This would have to be equal to 0 to get a possible maximum or minimum. x equals 2. Yeah. So x equals 2. Okay, so that place, that's our possible candidate for a, a max or a min. Yeah. All right. 
So what can the second derivative tell us about whether or not that's a max or a min? Well, it's, the term will always be positive. Uh, so so if the positiveness or negativeness of the second derivative is apparently important? Okay, what? So it's always positive, that means it's going to be concave up. Okay, so a positive second derivative means concave up. This second derivative, as we said, will always be positive. There's nothing we can do to this function. It doesn't change. It's a constant function. So there we go. It's always concave up. So if it's everywhere concave up, and at this place we have a zero slope. So what did just be minimum. Yeah. Well, let me look at that. That's a parabola, right? We can go back and so it's concave up. We get a zero slope, so we must have a minimum at two comma negative three. Where did the negative three come from? That's the y. Oh, okay. <laughs> when we say maximum and minimum, we're talking about the the highest or the lowest. We're talking about y value. Right? Now it's it's useful to say there's a minimum value at x equals two. We want to know what that value is. When we say value, we mean y value. The output of a function is what we are interested in. On nine, can you like? I don't want you to go over anything unless somebody really wants to go through with it. But can you just like tell us what you're doing each one of them? Like okay. the second derivative or first derivative? So first one is the first. Part A, uh, we, we are given a function that tells us <coughs> the position or the distance of a particle, right? And so the velocity is measuring, what does the velocity measure? No. Change. Rate of change. Rate of change of the distance, right? So the first function is a function that tells us the distance. The rate of change of the distance is what we call velocity. So the rate of change, the derivative is rate of change of the original. That's what we mainly want to pull out of this, is that the derivative of a function is the rate of change of that function. How fast is changing at any given point. So, okay, so we find s prime of t, which can also be called v of t, velocity at time t. Um, okay, so what would you say, like, how do we define moving in a positive direction. What's that? Positive y value. Of what? The derivative of velocity. Of first. Of velocity, right? Movement, how fast we're moving, or which direction we're moving is a description of the velocity. Now, if I just tell you that uh, from, uh, as a reference from the wall, I'm at, you know, two meters away from the wall, it doesn't tell you anything about which direction I'm going. It would be hard to tell if you're just looking at a picture of me frozen which direction I was moving. Okay? So I'm going to figure out the nature of my movement, the way that I'm changing where I am, that's movement. I would have to look at velocity. Velocity would be positive if I'm moving in a positive direction, whether that means forward or to the right, it doesn't really specify. But we're moving in a positive direction if our velocity is positive. We're moving in a negative direction if our velocity is negative. Okay. So for part B, we would want to know what about the velocity? Well, part B just says, where is it moving in a positive direction? So we just want to know, where is the velocity positive? Right. So let's say for t equals what? That will be an interval, right? It'll be from here to there. For part C, we want to know where the velocity is negative. And for part D, we want to know when does it go from being positive to being negative. That's that be zeros in the slope. Yeah. Zeros in the slope of the original graph. Yes. The original graph would have that have a zero slope. That's where the particle has stopped moving, say, forward, and it has started moving downward. Which okay. means downward. It's like it's fine. Forward or backward. Stop moving forward and start moving backward. Stop moving positive and start moving negative. So it defines like where we're moving positive and that we define like those zero slopes in the first derivative and you plug in points to left or right to get those? Yeah. Okay. 
Because here's the thing, it asks where does it change direction. Now all we've done so far, um, well, if we've already defined the places where it's moving positive and where it's moving negative, wherever it stopped going positive and started going negative, that would be where it's changed direction. Right? If, uh, if it doesn't change direction though, if its velocity doesn't change, if it goes positive, positive velocity, right? Well, this is the, the graph of S of T, just the position. So it's moving forward, it's increasing its distance, then it stops, and then it keeps going positive, it hasn't changed direction, so it does have a zero slope. Okay. So, what would we do? How would we accomplish that? We'll just sum up what Connor just said. We'll, for both of these really, set V of T, or S prime, equal to zero. We'll solve for T, okay? And we can look at this, see it's a third degree. So the derivative would be a second degree, so we'll possibly get two values. Maybe we'll get t equals something and t equals something else. Okay. And I know from working with another student that we got four and six. and six as those values. So those are the places where we, we don't know anything for b and c quite yet, but we do know possibly where we stop moving forward and start moving negative, vice versa. Right. So to figure that out, to figure out, uh, from all the way back here to four, if we're moving moving in a positive or negative direction, what do we need to do to find that out? Plug in something to the left of four and see is it moving positive? Is it velocity positive or velocity negative? And at six, <coughs> somewhere between uh, four and six, probably at five, we need to see what's happening there. Is it got a positive or a negative velocity? And after that, so maybe at seven, we need to test that too. So we'll test to be zero as well. So it's like right function is increasing and decreasing. It's exactly what it is. You would plug those into the original function? Um, these? Yeah. We want to know, we're looking at part B, we want to know where the particle is moving in a positive direction. So that would be velocity. Okay. The velocity tells us uh, how it's moving. Okay. And so it goes, the original function is speed and then velocity and then that's what so The original speed. function is where it is. Position, distance. Then the derivative of that <coughs> would be how that distance is changing with velocity. And then if we if it asks us about acceleration, that would be the rate of change of the velocity. But it doesn't ask us about that. So, okay. so if you're finding increasing and decreasing, you do the first derivative and then you find the so zero. zero. Okay. Yeah. So and then choose test points in between those zeros, those zero slopes. Finding critical numbers, we just define critical numbers. Hannah, what's the definition of a critical number? Any point where the slope is zero or undefined. Okay, so we gotta find places where the slope is zero or undefined. Slope is defined by the derivative, so we should find the derivative. Okay, so what rules do we need to use to find the derivative of such a function? We need the chain rule, because we're gonna take the derivative of the square root of a function, not just the square root of x. Anything else? The product. Product because we have a function times another function, right? So let's look at it this way. Uh, g of c is u is a function times a function. So g prime of t is u prime v plus v prime u, right? Now v v is that second function. That second function here is going to need the chain rule on it. So part of taking the derivative of v is going to be the chain rule. 
so we don't forget when we get to that part of the image. So we can just kind of follow our little derivative map here. U prime, what's the derivative of the first function? One. One, okay, times P, which is just the square root of 10 minus T, plus V prime, get ready to use the chain rule, Okay, so the thing about that is it's, yeah. it's easier to look at it as 10 minus t to the 1 half power. Oh, okay. We don't have a square root or an nth root rule, right? We write roots as fractional powers and then use the power rule. Okay, so the derivative of this will be, I'm going to bring that down in front, 1 half times 10 minus t to the, the negative 1 half. The negative 1 half because you subtract 1 from that power. Okay, here's the chain rule part. And then you would multiply it by negative 1. Right, the derivative of 10 minus t is really just the, that 0 minus uh, the derivative of t, which is 1. So negative 1. So if we're going to multiply this by negative 1, we can just take this out and make it negative. Okay, okay. so there's a chain rule being used. And then we need to do, have, well, then we need to have u in there, so there's yes. t. So yeah, times t. So v prime u, u is the first function, that's t. Okay, so we need to find critical values, so one place to find critical values is where the derivative is zero, so we can set it equal to zero. So root 10 minus t minus, now once we're done taking the derivatives, whatever, however many derivatives we're needing to take, it's sometimes easier to look at it back in radical form, where we put it in the, in the roots, okay? So, negative 1 half t over the square root of Not the negative square root of 10. The negative powers mean over, over the square root, root of 10. It's over that thing, right? Over that power. So we have uh, one half, one this needs to be the negative. So 1 mm -hmm. half times 1 over the square root of 10 minus t, because this is this would be in the denominator, <coughs> and 1 half power means square root, times t over 1. So you could write this like this. Uh, 1 times t over 2 times the square root of 10 minus t, we set it equal to 0. Mm -hmm. Now if we need 1 times t, we can just write t. Multiply by 10 minus t. What's that? Multiply by 10 Should it cross by 10 minus t? Or to get 10 minus t to the numerator, shouldn't we or can we leave that in the bottom? We can we add it. it. Yeah. Do you know saying we'll multiply both sides by, by 1 over? One over the square root of 10 minus t. Okay, this is all lots of different ideas. Um, so I, I heard this, let's try that. Square root of 10 minus t. So we distribute it to there and to there. Okay, what happens when we take one over root 10 minus t times root 10 minus t? One. We get one minus. Okay, what happens when we multiply this? We get minus right t over t times t. Would it be 10 minus t? It would. When we take the square root of 10 minus t times the square root of 10 minus t, those will just cancel each other out. So we get t, right, t times 1, over 2 times root 10 minus t times root 10 minus t, which is just 10 minus t. That's equal to 0. And then you can subtract 1. You can distribute the 2. You can distribute the 2. 1 minus t over twin t minus 2t. Square roots, but we do that to this denominator. Make it make one twenty plus two t minus two t. Yeah, so we make it one twenty plus two t minus two t. Multiply by the three t equals twenty. T equals twenty over here. If we multiply okay. this by twenty plus two t, what would that give us? It'd give us four hundred minus four t squared in the denominator. I was just thinking we do one twenty over well twenty minus two t over. So, oh, make this into 20 minus 2t over 20 minus 2t, get yeah. common denominator, yeah. okay? So this could be 20 minus 2t over 20 minus 2t, which means we're going to have a common denominator, so we subtract t from that over 20 minus 2t, still equals 0. Does that make sense? Just got a common denominator here, and then we, now 
have a common denominator, and the result would be 20 minus 2t minus t in the numerator. What's one of those? I don't like the minus 2t. Uh, I'm just doing 3t here. Minus 3t. What's that? Okay, when we have a denominator that we don't want, it does help to multiply both sides by, because really when you think about it, if you have a fraction equal to zero, it doesn't matter what the denominator is as long as it's not zero. Um, only the numerator needs to be equal to zero. Right, so if you multiply both sides by the denominator now, we get 20 minus 3t equals zero, t equals 20. Why do you have to find the denominator? Because if the denominator is zero, then it's undefined, right? That's where the derivative would be undefined. So 20 minus 2t equals zero. So t equals 10. And at the beginning, it said t has to be less than 10. This is right. T has to be less than 10. So this point is irrelevant. So the only critical number is 20 over 3. Which is less than 10 because 20 over 2 is 10. Wow. All right. Okay. Yeah. 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 All right. You ready to go? Yeah. We'll find out. All right. Stow all your luggage. You have been your homework in. Yeah, it's in your homework in. Oh. We finally got that home with that. Reaches. Slack. There you go, Molly. All the points you use is on our training.